Good morning, Sharptown family. It's nice to see each one of you here this morning. Uh, thank you for taking time to be with us and to worship the Lord together today. Uh, just a couple of real quick announcements and reminders as well. Uh, we're trying to uh, be faithful to this new protocol with regards to our masks. I know some of you are still working on your morning coffee. I'm glad to see you brought your Wawa with you. Uh, when you're finished that, okay, just put the mask back up. That'd be great. Thanks for, uh, for abiding by these, uh, these kind of rules and guidelines. I know it's hard for all of us to become accustomed to that. Uh, I do want to go ahead and say, uh, as we conclude our time together today on your way out as well, uh, we want to be very careful about the whole idea of physical distancing and social distancing. People have said how grateful we are, uh, that they feel pretty safe about coming to church on Sunday mornings, and so we're glad that you're here uh, this morning with us. I would like to invite you to uh, put your hands together and welcome the Heckman family this morning. Yeah! <clears throat> nice to have them. And... Uh, Uncle Dave and Great Uncle Ty, and so uh, we're glad to have them this morning as we worship the Lord. Uh, thank you for being here. <clears throat> Good morning, Sharp Town. Y'all look beautiful, even though I can only see like half of you. You look beautiful. Let's all stand up together and worship the Lord. We're going to give glory to God this morning. So, like, feel free to <laughs> dance and wave your hands, and it all just looks like it's... <laughs> all right. Holy is the Lord. Stand 
and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy. so good to see you guys this morning. You can take a seat. And I was thinking as we were singing that song, the whole earth is filled with his glory. 
That includes you and I this morning. Our voices raised to heaven fill this room with his glory. And so thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us online. If you're online, just take a moment, say hello, and let us know that you have joined us. How about you guys take a minute and turn around, wave, shout to the person behind you, just say, you look good. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Just a couple things. I think Doug already mentioned them. You know, we are following state guidelines, so please do your very best. Keep your masks on. Refrain from touching one another. You can wave and shout. And I think I mentioned this two weeks ago. We've done tremendous. You guys are fantastic. I keep saying this each and every week. You're doing so good registering online. I didn't think Sharptown would be rule followers, but you're fantastic. Who would have thought? You can do it. Uh, but just one thing, on the way out, just watch for the ushers' directions because we do real good coming in. But on the way out, everybody kind of congregates and it's like a mosh pit on the way out the door and everyone's up in your personal space. And while that may make some of you uncomfortable, it does make others uncomfortable. And so just kind of pay attention to those directions on the way out. Wait a little bit if you need to. All right, just a couple of things to highlight. We have something... Well, next week is communion, and so if you're joining us today and you're not going to be able to be here in person next week or you're part of our online audience, feel free to stop by the church office this week and pick up your prepackaged communion elements. And so there's somebody in the office most days. And so I have something really exciting to share with you. Kind of we look at the church calendar, and there's not a whole lot that we can do right now, but... We have tried this particular series a couple times, and I'm so excited to say we are bringing Sharptown U, U, Sharptown U to you guys in just a couple weeks. And so it's going to be virtual. And so Matt Ayers and Charles Lake are going to be teaching from their book, Holy is a Four-Letter Word. We have some copies here at the church if you don't already have one from the last time. And so they're going to be here virtual Sunday morning. Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. You are welcome to join us here. You'll sign up like you have been. We can accommodate 100 per each one of those meetings here. Or you can join from home from your computer. And so you'll be able to watch that Facebook Live or directly on the Zoom links that Matt has provided. And so all that will be up on the church website tomorrow. You'll be able to sign up and register for those. So mark your calendar. It's going to be a great several days together. It's going to look a little different than what we've done in the past, but it's still going to be really, really exciting. And then just to highlight, we've been doing this every week as well. Prayer is important and prayer matters. We gather together for prayer Sunday evening and Friday morning. And so you're welcome to come and join if you have a prayer need. Text one of the staff or somebody on that prayer ministry to send an email to the office. And if you can't join us, we would love to partner with you in prayer. And then we also mention this each and every week. There are so many ways you can give. You have been so faithful. You have been so generous. There are plates on the way out. You're welcome to give that to the greeters on the way out today or to do that online or from the Give Plus app. Would you take a moment and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you already for the great time that we have had worshiping you this morning. We sense your presence. Lord, as we think about our giving and we think about the things that are on our calendar, Lord, would you just continue to direct the paths of Sharptown Church? Lord, while things look different right now, we still recognize that there is so much ministry that is still happening. And so, Lord, show us where you are at work, and we are so excited to join you. Bless those who give however it is that they are able to give. And, Lord, show us who's in need, even here in our county, so that we can continue to be your hands and feet. Lord, we love you. We continue in worship. In your name we pray. Amen.
nothing worth more that would ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of laughs when my heart becomes free and my shame is Amen. Good morning, Sharp Town. Good to see you this morning. We're glad that you were here and ventured forth from the confines of your residence into this place of worship that we can gather as God's people and be reminded 
who he is and who we are in Jesus Christ. Now, the COVID-19 virus has affected us in so many different ways, affected the world, affected countries differently, affected people differently. And uh, I, I noticed here this morning that Bob Vanderslice must be affected financially. He's not wearing socks, so he, apparently he can't, he can't afford to buy socks. So I'm going to start a GoFundMe page. <laughs> Banks must be in real dire trouble. Anyway, so with that in mind, let's go to, <laughs> to the Lord in prayer this morning, shall we? How awesome it is, Lord, to be in your house, to be with your people, to praise you. You've invited us here. In fact, you called us here, Lord, and we're here. We are here. And there's something special about being in your presence. Oh, it's wonderful to see it on TV. It's wonderful to hear it through the radio and all that nonsense. But, Lord, it's something special about being together in the house of the Lord. To worship you. To praise you. To lift up holy hands before you. To declare the wonders and the marvelous majesty of our God. And, Lord, we're grateful. We're thankful. Remind us this morning, Lord, that you called us by name to follow you, to invite you into our lives. You called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You called us to know the new birth, to be saved, to be sanctified, to be filled with your presence and your Holy Spirit. You called us out of this world, out of the world, into your kingdom so that we can go back into the world with the joy of the Lord and the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. You called us, Lord, by name, by name, and you know all about us. And, and Lord, for some people, that strikes fear into their hearts because they try to be hidden from you. They don't want you to know the deep, dark secrets of their life's experiences, of their thoughts, of their fears, their anxieties, their worries, their pain. But the reality is, you, you know all about it anyway. We're just fooling ourselves. So, Lord, help us to be open to you and all that you have in store for us individually as a church family. As the body of Christ, may we go forth from this place with a renewed hope, with a deeper faith, with a contagious joy, knowing that your grace is sufficient, knowing that your mercy permeates all of our being. In order to be gather here, we, we pray, Lord, that you will sustain us through all this COVID-19 stuff that's going on and all the other nonsense that's going on. Because though the world fall apart, you are constant. Though, though the world is run by the prince of this world, we operate under the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We will not be defeated. Though this world blow up, <laughs> we have a home in eternity in a little place somewhere that's called heaven. Because we belong to you and you belong to us. And that's a certitude. It's a promise. That's a given. And now, Lord, prepare our own hearts and minds to hear what your servant Doug has to say to us through your word. Let your word find a home in our hearts, our minds that we would understand, our ears to hear, our hearts to believe, our will to put it into practice, to follow after you, to live for you, and to live with you. Lord, we pray for those who are going through tough times these days, physically, diseases, sickness, Financial issues, job issues, relational issues, all kinds of stuff. We are a broken people, Lord. 
but you're the healer. Continue to heal us, Lord, as we open ourselves to you and allow you to see our innards, not our physical innards necessarily, but our spiritual innards, that you might make us whole and complete. It's in Jesus' awesome, powerful, sweet, and blessed name that we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, once again, I uh, want to welcome you to Sharptown Church. We've been taking time during the uh, uh, summer months to uh, really do a deep dive into one of the small letters inside of the New Testament uh, that Paul wrote. It was the very first letter that he wrote. Uh, probably somewhere about 15, 16, 17 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as a result of that, we have some of the earliest ideas or the earliest thoughts about what Christianity should look like and, and how that should be framed inside of the world. Let me remind you that the, the church uh, in Thessalonica was undergoing persecution, and so their proclamation of following Jesus Christ uh, was not an easy one. Uh, so they paid the price for their uh, dedication, for their commitment, for their following of Christ inside of the world in which they lived. In addition to that, uh, we want to go ahead and say that uh, Paul thought so highly of this church uh, in Thessalonica that they became really a model church. And so as a result of that, uh, people all around the community of Thessalonica began to hear and also understand about who Jesus Christ was through the witness of these individuals who had come to Christ. You'll remember, uh, weeks and weeks ago, we made the statement that they had... Uh, Christ's love had been shed abroad inside of their heart such that they began to demonstrate a walk of faith in front of other people. That they indeed began to live a life of love in front of others and that they had a hope of their salvation not only for the current day but also in the days to come. We said that Thessalonians is broken down into five chapters uh, about 89 verses and about 1,600 words. We mentioned as well that this book is, is broken up into five chapters and it's bracketed by prayers at the beginning of the book in chapter 1, verse 1, and then at the end of the book as well. And we're going to look at some of these words in chapter 5. At the end of chapter 3, there is also a prayer. And so the first three chapters of Thessalonians are about Paul and his relationship to this early church and how they responded to his message and how they responded to the gospel and how Paul then in in response to them some of the encouraging words that he had about them and then that's at the end of chapter 3 chapter 4 and chapter 5 talks then about some of the practicalities of the Christian faith and we've been thinking about that for the last couple of weeks we mentioned that behavior mattered inside of the early church and so not only as a result of their witness inside of uh, the church of Thessalonica but also how they were living faith in front of others the morality that came along with being a Christian their hope for the eternity to spend with God and Paul begins to answer some of their questions in chapter 4 and on into chapter 5. Uh, today I'd like to take you to the uh, last closing section of the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And I'd like to invite you to turn with me to chapter 5. Uh, we're going to spend uh, just a, a little bit of time here this morning. And I want to tell you that uh, uh, several years ago, I ran across a, a book by a guy whose uh, last name is uh, Siemens. Uh, you heard me reference David Siemens. This is actually David's brother. Uh, his name was J.T. Siemens. He wrote a book about the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit inside of a person's life that we actually have been singing about. And as he was working his way through some thoughts on that, one of the chapters has stuck with me and has continued to be part uh, forming in shaping my life and thinking about uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, we have thought about this over the 
20 some years that I've been here at Sharptown Church as your pastor in a couple of different settings, uh, but I, devotionally this morning, I want to revisit some things that become very important about the idea of the Holy Spirit being present inside of our life. Before we have a chance to read, let me go back and, and say to you that the book of 1 Thessalonians then is structured in such a way that Paul affirms their faith and the fact that they've said yes to Jesus Christ, that they have formed a church, that they are making a, a statement about who they are and what they believe in the first three chapters. And then he's encouraging them as they follow Jesus Christ, that this is just not a say yes to Jesus and be done, uh, but it's an ongoing, sustained relationship that allows God's Spirit to form and shape their lives and their behavior. The word we use inside of the New Testament for that is the word sanctification. And that is that when we say yes to Jesus, that he, by his Holy Spirit, comes in to dwell inside of our hearts and lives. And he begins to shape and form us, we mentioned, like a home renovation project, if you will, from the inside out. And we sang just earlier, Lord let me become more aware of your spirit in my life day by day as you continue to shape and form me. And that is exactly what Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians. As you, the Thessalonian church, continue to follow Jesus Christ, I want you to become more and more aware of the Holy Spirit's role inside of your life and inside of your community of faith such that the Spirit of God will continue to shape you in all areas. And today, I want to take a look at three very practical ways in which that happens inside of your life and inside of my life. And an admonition that Paul has about how we might think about this very important topic of God's Spirit being present inside of your life and present inside of my life, shaping our behavior, shaping our moods, shaping our attitudes, and shaping our lives. And so as you uh, come to the very close of the book of 1 Thessalonians, you'll recognize that uh, Paul, kind of like he does in many of the other letters inside the New Testament, he provides some very short, very succinct statements that, friends, listen, we could have spent all of our time here in chapter 5 because uh, they're that important as far as the phrases inside of our Christian experience. And so if you have a device, you're welcome to go ahead and follow along. Uh, if you have a Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I think it's somewhere right around the verse 13, 14, something like that. Uh, it is marked off as the last paragraph inside of chapter 5. And you'll find these words on the screen as well. And so let me read for you. My friends, says Paul. Now again, recognize that he just doesn't call them friends. First Thessalonians, more than any other letter in the New Testament, you begin to see you know, Paul's pastoral heart, if you will. His affection for this church. Because they have become a church, kind of a model church inside of uh, inside of the Mediterranean Rim. My friends, he says, we ask you to be thoughtful of your leaders. Be thoughtful of your leaders who are working hard to tell you how to live for the Lord. Be thoughtful of them, says Paul. Show them great respect and love because of their work. And try to get along with one another. You remember we had some very uh, straightforward admonition just a, a week or so ago about mind your own business now Paul follows that up with the listen and by the way it's important that you try to get along with one another uh, that's a that's kind of a, a pretty good indicator that a church is a healthy church when they get along with one another uh, Jesus prayed that they would be one as we are one uh, it's a good thing when people who come to church together get along with one another and so as a result of that, Paul says, uh, don't forget, listen, get along with one another. It's an indicator, it's an indicator to those who are in the community that God is doing something inside of your life. And let me just pause and say, this is not, this is not just a kind of passing statement. 
This is not just a kind of a glancing blow that Paul says. Because I want you to understand that inside of this church, there are people from different backgrounds. People who have never, ever been inside of community with one another. There are people who have a Jewish background and are sitting in the same church as people who are Gentile background. And there are people who are sitting in church with people that are government officials or leaders inside the community with people who are people who are in different economic status, sitting in the same church with one another. And I want to say to you, this is what makes the church of Thessalonica remarkable today. And this is what makes the church of Jesus Christ remarkable today. That people who gather together, who otherwise don't see one another socially, who otherwise may not be in one another's a sphere of influence during the week, gather together and raise holy hands in worship and praise to Jesus Christ because he died on the cross and he rose again and is transforming their lives. This is not just a small statement here in Thessalonians 5. And I want to say to you, uh, this is a remarkable statement. That God is forming and shaping a people that is looking beyond the exterior, looking beyond the background, looking beyond the label that the other person has inside of their life when they gather together to worship Jesus. The inference is found in chapter 1 also, but here again he brings it back in chapter 5. Get along with one another, because as you do, the people all around you are recognizing that something's happening inside of your life. But let's uh, move on quickly if we could. And then again, he calls them, my friends, I beg you to warn everyone who isn't living right. Encourage anyone who feels left out. Help all those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. Don't be hateful to people just because they're hateful to you. Rather, be good to each other and to everyone else. And then these very short phrases, because he wants to be sure he captures this. Let's go to the next slide if we could. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants you to do. Next slide. Don't turn away God's spirit. Don't ignore prophecies, put everything to the test, accept what is good and don't have anything to do with evil, and then the closing prayer, next slide if we could, I pray that God who gives peace will make you completely holy, will make your spirit, soul, body be kept healthy and faultless until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now next Sunday we're going to talk about this prayer particularly. And the one who chose you can be trusted, and he will do this. But I want to go ahead and pick up a phrase that's tucked inside of these closing remarks for Paul to the Thessalonian church. Let's go to the next slide if we could. It's found in verse 19, and Paul says this. If you read out of the King James Version, or an older translation, uh, and even some of the newer translations, because... This word captures what Paul is wanting to say. It is this. Do not quench the spirit. Other translations say, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not turn away God's spirit. Do not restrain the Holy Spirit. Do not put out the Spirit's fire And then do not extinguish the Spirit. Depending upon what translation you have, I think probably uh, they would be encompassed inside of this list uh, that is used for the word about quenching the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you about the imagery that's here. The imagery for Paul is the fact that 
uh, he draws out of the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, cl- the clear imagery that whenever fire is represented, it is emblematic, or it is an indicator of God's presence inside of circumstance or people's lives. For instance, you remember early on in the book of Exodus, the the tree that was on fire that Moses stood in front of, and it was not consumed. And the flames stood as a representation of God's divine presence and God's divine power. In the tabernacle, inside of the Holy of Holies, There was fire there representing the divine presence and the divine power of God in the midst of that circumstance. Remember, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 6, we talked about that God's presence was there. And the Bible says that Isaiah was overcome and he said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. And he said God's presence was there. And the angelic beings were all around him. And his train, as it were, filled the temple. And there is fire there. As the angel took tongs and lifted a coal off of the the altar. Who will go with us? And he put the tongs, he put the coal on Isaiah's burning lips, on his lips. Fire in the Old Testament stands as a representation of God's presence and God's power. Occasionally, we see also a hint of God's divine presence by the Holy Spirit, but most of the time, when, then, when you move into the New Testament, any time that you see the idea or the imagery of fire, it is representation of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You'll remember the words of John the Baptist, that Jesus will baptize with water and with fire. You remember in Acts chapter 2 that the very presence of the Holy Spirit as the flames of fire rested upon those and they were filled with God's presence and God's Holy Spirit. Paul is grabbing on to that image here inside of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And let me remind you, There's a reason for that. Think with me for just a little bit about the characterization or what the characteristics of fire. Fire illuminates and so does the Holy Spirit. Fire is energy and it energizes. So is the Holy Spirit. Fire refines and purifies. So does the Holy Spirit. Fire welds or fuses things together, unites, so does the Holy Spirit. And I would suspect that if you give a lot of thought to that, there probably are a list of other ways in which fire and the Holy Spirit are similar in nature and in characteristic. Paul is grabbing hold of that image, and he is saying to the Thessalonians, God has deposited inside of your life the very presence of His Holy Spirit. Whatever you do, whatever you do, tend the fire and don't let the fire of God's presence go out in your life. Don't quench the fire. Don't stifle it. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Now, let's pause for just a moment and let's think about this statement. Is Paul saying today that you can frustrate God's Spirit inside of your life? Is Paul saying that you, because of I'll say that I, because of my stubborn self-will, can frustrate God's movement inside of my life. Is Paul saying that there are times inside of my life when I am going to choose to do what I want to do, even though the Holy Spirit is inclining me, prompting me, 
instructing me to do something different. And I would say this morning that if you have walked with Jesus for any period of time, you would absolutely conclude the same that I do this morning. Paul is absolutely saying, yes, we can in fact frustrate God's Holy Spirit inside of our lives. As a matter of fact, we can see that happen in a number of different instances inside of the Bible where God was leading, prompting, instructing one of his followers who had faith in him to go in one direction and they made a willful, deliberate decision to go in another direction. I don't think that for many of us that drawing on the name of Jonah in this situation is too far of a stretch. God calls Jonah to go in this direction and Jonah says, absolutely not. There is no way I'm going in this direction. And he went exactly 180 degrees geographically in the opposite direction. And friends, listen, that happens to you and that happens to me. This is why Paul's admonition becomes so practical for you and for me today. Paul said this, even though church at Thessalonica, you are doing fantastic things. Do not frustrate God's spirit. When God's spirit says move, you move. Listen, all of us have had circumstances where this has happened and we have not moved. You have one of those gentle whispers inside of your heart. Pick up the phone and call. And then you find you've missed the opportunity. You send a text and you've missed the opportunity. Get in the car and go over to see and you've missed the opportunity because I'm too busy, I can't, I don't have time, I don't know if I should, I'm reluctant, I'm hesitant, you fill in the blank. But I think that Paul is saying very specifically one of the things that's important inside of our Christian experience as well as a church, as well as individuals, is how we learn not to frustrate God's spirit inside of our life, because as we do, we continue to push God's spirit and the, the volume of God's spirit down. He said, listen, when God is speaking, we need to be people who listen. Now, it's interesting that in the New Testament, other writers, as well as Paul, give indication that when God comes to take residence up inside of our life, he begins to do this renovation project. And we could go to the Galatian letter and read all about the fruit of the Spirit, of love and joy and peace, because God does this work inside of our heart and our character begins to look different. Because remember, the end game here is not just to get us to heaven. The end game is to have God shape your character to be just like His character. But there are these behaviors that happen as well when God's Spirit comes to live inside of your life and inside of mine. I want to highlight just three this morning, if I could, and then we'll close in just a couple of moments. The first comes out of the book of Acts. This is a behavior that uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, pairs with the Holy Spirit. And he says this, uh, in this instance, Peter is the one who's talking as Luke is giving the historical account. They had been arrested. They couldn't believe what these guys were saying. They told them, you have to stop being uh, vocal and verbal about your faith. And they make the proclamation in chapter 5 that we must obey God and not you. And uh, they were really surprised at how uh, bold they were. And then uh, Peter makes this statement and says, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey. Now notice what happens. Peter, he puts together this idea that the Holy Spirit and a person who shares their faith or talks about their faith, they go together. This should not be a surprise for you this morning. And 
the idea that there is a, let's use this terminology, that there is a witness flame inside of your life. And so, listen, I know some of you have your devices in your hand or you're you're holding hands or something like this. Free up your hand and do this with me right here. Everybody in the auditorium, okay, don't don't think I'm going to make you do silly, right? You know what's happening here, don't you? Okay, Okay, keep your finger up. Look, Jesus is the one who taught us this. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it what? Now, why? Because when the Spirit of God moves into your heart, He compels us to tell other people about what has happened. As a matter of fact, listen, two-thirds, keep your, keep your lights up, two-thirds, two-thirds of the word God is go witness you have a witness flame right shine it all over sharp town i'm gonna let it shine right and then this hide it under a bushel what no why because listen when god moves into your life and when god moves into my life He does something that only he has the capacity to do, and we are people who testify and witness to that. I want to say to you, do not let your witness flame go out. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for a long time, and as a result of that, your witness flame is not burning nearly as bright as it once did. Don't let your witness flame go out. Okay. Don't don't blow them out. Just put them down. Because we're going to add to that. Now Paul says this. Don't extinguish that. Witness and Holy Spirit go together. It's a behavior that happens when God comes to take up residence in our heart. Next slide if we could. Here's another behavior. When the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, and as we're praying, Paul says this in the book of Romans. In the same way, and he's talking about prayer, God's Spirit helps us in our weakness. Sometimes we don't know how to to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. You know what this is like. Sometimes the pain is just so great, all you can do is just sit in the very presence of God. And he interprets the groans of our heart. Listen, friends, you have a witness flame. You have a prayer flame. The behavior of prayer is paired together with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. There is an expectation that if God comes to live in your heart and mind, that we talk to him, that we pray. And the Holy Spirit helps us. So, the first flame is a witness flame. The second flame is a prayer flame. Don't let them be extinguished in your life, says Paul. And I would ask you today, how is your witness flame? How is your prayer flame? And then last, Paul says this in another section. Again, he's writing to the church of the Ephesian church. And he uses similar language. He says, do not grieve, do not quench, do not frustrate the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. And then he gets at this angle using this terminology. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ forgives you. And let me use one word to summarize his statement here. And I think that a good word for that would be love. And we know that this word works here in this because in other sections of his writing, he says this, that God shed his love abroad in our hearts by faith when Christ moves in. But notice the thing that sometimes puts out the love flame inside of our life. Bitterness. Rage. Anger. Talking about other people. 
and forms of hatred or anger or malice towards other people. These things put out the love flame inside of your life. Oh, and by the way, there's this really practical thing that if you harbor bitterness towards other people and you have an unforgiving spirit, the love flame begins to flicker inside of your life. So, again, set the things aside on your lap. Hold them up, three of them, right here. Three of them. Witness flame. Prayer flame. Love flame. Inside of the New Testament, these behaviors are paired with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says this. <clears throat> Listen, church. Do not let your witness flame, your prayer flame, your love flame, do not put out the Holy Spirit's activity inside of your life. I'm going to ask if uh, Emily and Phil, if the band will make their way back to the platform this morning. And as they're making their way back to the platform, let me just tell you this, that in 1933, Almost a hundred years ago, there was an organization that developed, it was really a presidential nomination uh, and a presidential movement. It was called the Tennessee Valley Authority that took the initiative to make sure that people in the backwoods of some of our southern states had electricity. Bob, still people in Tennessee don't have electricity, so I just want to say that to you. And the no socks, right at home. So anyhow, the, uh, so this, they, as the Tennessee Valley Authority began to work their way in some of the remote areas inside of Tennessee, they began to run across some people who didn't have electricity. And as a result of that, the movement inside the country was that everybody would have electricity. And so the Tennessee Valley Authority ran into this one little, one little guy who lived in a one-room house. And, and they said, sir, uh, we are going to be going ahead and putting some energy, some power through here. You need to move. And he said, I'm not moving. And he said, no, you need to move. And they said, no, I, I'm not moving. And finally, as they spent time with him, they wanted to know, why in the world won't you move? We're going to actually provide a house for you with electricity. And he walked him inside of his one-room house, and he said, listen, you see that fire? And they said, yeah. And he said, listen, my great-grandfather built that fire, and it never went out as long as he was alive. My father tended that fire, and it's never gone out as long as he was alive. I've been tending that fire, and it has never gone out as long as I've been alive. They were moved by the story. They built him a, a small home. The workers from the TVA went ahead, and they shoveled some coals from the fire. They put it in the new house that they had for him, even though it had electricity. And they explained to him, listen... The fire continues. It is never going out. Do not extinguish the fire of the Holy Spirit. You have a witness flame. You have a prayer flame. You have a flame that is ignited by the Holy Spirit to love other people and to love God. Don't let the enemy have his way and extinguish the flame of the Holy Spirit inside of your life. Let's all stand. We're going to sing freedom.
Pray with me this morning. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, we've had of being in your presence and to sing, lift up your, our voices and to sing your praise. We're grateful uh, for the movement of your Holy Spirit inside of our lives. And thank you this morning that you have the capacity even to talk to us about some other item inside of our lives that maybe we've not even discussed. And so we pray today that you will continue to move, speak to us, give guidance and direction, and thank you that we can find and do find freedom in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who breaks every chain. And so this morning, Lord, we pray that you'll help us this week to be your witness. Help us this week to be people who stand in the gap and pray for our lives and those around us. Help us to be people this morning who don't allow bitterness, anger, or malice, or rage uh, win the day, but help us to love other people and to love you with our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. Lord, and more than anything else, in the midst of our time together, we would ask that when you invite us to move, that we will move, that we will speak when you invite us to speak, that we would be prompted by your Holy Spirit, we would be obedient, because we do not want to be people who quench, extinguish, or put out the fire of your Holy Spirit inside of our lives. And so we would ask that our lives would burn brightly inside of our community, in our homes, and that others would see the God who is doing a transforming work inside of our lives. In his name we pray. Amen. Go in peace, Sharptown. Thank you for being here. <laughs> 